Michael Mahagan and Chair. Uh, the Irish have a tendency to talk a lot, so if I go on for too long, please make sure to, to inter interject and you know where the bathrooms are in case you don't like it. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say it's a pleasure to be here in Bilbao today with like-minded people. Uh, it's an honour to share the stage with colleagues from uh, Oiskail area, Bildu, Sartu, Dilinka, Siritsa, ODP, Sel, and all of you as well. Uh, and um, just before I speak about the, uh, the Troika stuff we're going to be discussing, I think it would be important to note that since before the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, Sinn Féin have been involved in helping to assist the building of the peace in the Basque Country. The Irish peace process is seen by many as a model or an example of what can be achieved when there is political will and we believe that there is overwhelming support within Basque society for a resolution of the conflict. The decision by ETA to put all of its arms beyond operational use with the help of international observers has been described by our party president, Gerry Adams, as momentous and a historic development. The Spanish government and the French need to recognise the courageous and brave step and enter into a negotiated peace settlement with ETA. 130,000 people marched in Bilbao in January to support the peace process and calling for the rep repatriation and release of political prisoners from the conflict. The Spanish state must be one of the only states in the world that will not willingly enter into a peace process. Arnaldo Otegi, the Basque leader, is still imprisoned even though he is helping to lead the peace process from the Basque side and that is unacceptable. It's also very unhelpful that the Spanish state summoned the international observers to court over helping to facilitate the peace process. There's an onus on the Spanish and French governments, we believe, to respond positively to the announcement by the Verification Committee and we in Sinn Féin wish the peace process the best of luck. I think, uh, I feel as if, after listening to the other speakers, I need to make an apology. On behalf of the compliant Irish governments we've seen over the last number of years, we got into an economic crisis caused by bankers, speculators, and cronyism in our own country. We went cap in hand to the Troika, we took the medicine they gave us, we never asked for a write down, we loaded the burden on the shoulders of our citizens, we did everything the Troika told us to do, we hit all the targets, we're out of the bailout, and we're the best children in the class. But it's not a good picture in Ireland, so I'd just like to give you a sense of where we're at. The arrival of the Troika was a dark day in, the, in Irish history, and the blame for it lies with the Conservative government and an EU economic policy that had champion, championed the market above all else. There's no doubt that the harsh Troika programme and its slavish implementation by the government will leave real scars on Irish society. Long-term unemployment continues to be at 60% of all unemployed. We have alarmingly high levels of youth unemployment. We have greater levels of underemployment. 31% of all part-time workers are underemployed. We've seen a trend where newly qualified teachers, nurses, and again this week, social workers and junior doctors are asked to, be, to come into their profession at a much lower scale than their predecessors. 76,000 people left the workforce in the last two years, mostly due to emigration emigration and emigration is the policy of the austerity junkies. Our public services have been stripped bare. Since July 2008 approximately 20 billion euros has been cut from government spending affecting hospitals, schools and transport as well as direct cuts in civil servants pay. A wave of privatization has also seen valuable state assets sold off forever and there are more in train. Uh, that's happened in our telecommunications sector. Local government services have been privatised. We've had the ducks have been lined up with our water. Uh, our water providers are, are being set up to be privatised in future. Wind energy is being sold off to the highest bidder, and a possibility that our electricity grid might be next. We have 415,000 people on the live register, still over 14%. 300,000 people emigrated in the last four years and when you compare that to the last period of economic decline between 1980 and 86, only 120,000 people left at that stage. 49,000 people are on hospital waiting lists, 180,000 households are in mortgage distress, 
In the government's first year in office, the present government, the total number of businesses in the state fell by 6,000. And almost 11,000 full-time jobs have been lost and replaced by 14,400 part-time jobs. So I think the unemployment figures sometimes don't give you the full picture. The underemployment and the loss of full-time employment are also very telling in the Irish scenario. Soon our banks will undergo stress tests. It's no coincidence that these tests are coming up and that some of our international creditors were very wary about letting our state return to the markets without a safety net. And we're still weighed down by the bank debt. It's 16 months now since the Eurogroup spoke about separating banking and sovereign debt. It was a moment of hope for our small state that had so much toxic banking debt latched to it. But that moment passed. Our government failed to score the open goal. I hope some recapitalisation can still be achieved, but there is not one shred of evidence that it's on the cards. It didn't help that our Taoiseach or our Prime Minister told the high and mighty in Davos when he was sitting back in the chair that the Irish went mad partying when explaining our economic difficulties. Their coalition partners haven't been much better. The leader of the Irish Labour Party before the general election promised us it, it would be Labour's way or Frankfurt's way. And he was right. It was Frankfurt's way. Sinn Féin have been putting forward an alternative and the strategy that we have put together, just to, I'm not, I'm not sure how clear people would be of the political scenario in Ireland, but since the setup of our state, we've only ever had civil war politics and, and conservative government because we have two larger conservative parties who have literally uh, moved over and back into government with a, making coalitions with smaller parties from time to time. Uh, all of the parties uh, historically would have come from Sinn Féin, but the Sinn Féin of the present day really emerged in the troubles in the north of Ireland uh, and is very much the dominant nationalist party. We're a socialist republican party, obviously, but is the dominant nationalist party in the six counties in, in the north of Ireland for quite a number of years. And we share power in the power sharing assembly in the north of Ireland. It's a very different picture in, in southern Ireland. We're very much a small, up to now, minority party, but things are changing and we have a very definite strategy. And our strategy since the last general election has to become the main opposition party because we want to break the civil war politics and set up a left-right politics in Ireland again. What we've done is we've put forward fully costed pre-budget submissions and this has been very important because all of our detractors, particularly the media, would have accused us of fairy tale economics. They talk about the lefty econ economics that didn't add up or didn't make sense because it suited their own agenda. So our policy has been, in the last number of years, to ask parliamentary questions of our Department of Finance on every single budget item that we intended bringing forward. So it's been fully costed by themselves. So when it came to budget day, they couldn't question the mathematics. So it was argued on the politics. We've also tried to introduce this, the principle of equality budgeting into Irish budgets, which does, doesn't happen. Um, at every stage in the political process, we've been challenging the status quo and on all pieces of legislation, we make amendments uh, to stand up for the, the ordinary working class and those who are less well off. We work on an all island basis and at all levels of governance and that's important because we're in government in the north and we're not in government in the south and sometimes it gets thrown at us that, well, you're imp imposing cuts in the north but you're not imposing them down here. What's the scenario? But, uh, the obvious answer to that for people who will be in the know is that the budgetary scenario in the north is dictated by Westminster. So once that's sorted out, we'll be able to make different decisions. But we fight the same social issues and we work together as an all-island party. And the other thing that's been very important is to agitate our grassroots, the party membership, and increase the party membership to get a bigger political mandate. So what has the result of that been? In the local elections of 2009, we had a percentage of about 6% of the vote. That increased in 2011 to around 9%. Since the last general election in 2011, we've been in and around 16 to 18% on a regular basis. So we are increasing our mandate and the membership has increased. And even yesterday, there was an opinion poll which said we were at 22%, but even on our best day, I don't want to believe that, but we'll, we'll, we'll take the good news when it comes. 
But it does show that the party is building and we will have a bigger mandate and we're hoping that in the local elections and the EU elections that are coming up we can increase that. As I said, since the formation of the state, Ireland has only ever had Conservative government north and south. It's almost three years since Fine Gael and Labour took charge. They had a mandate for change because they have a huge majority, but instead they've carried on with the economic policies of austerity that were used beforehand. The past few years have been very difficult on working people and families in Ireland. Cut after cut, new tax after new tax, means that 30 billion euros has been taken out of our economy. Next year, this government plans to bring in another two billion of cuts, and this is after we've exited the bailout, so we're still cutting. We're still into austerity economics. We're still following the same policies. Each year, the governments have cut and taxed, and each year, it has been unfair. Each year, they've ignored our alternative budgets and protected the wealthy and cut public services deeper and deeper. Every step of the way, Sinn Féin have shown that there is and was an alternative. We've acknowledged the fact that new jobs are now being created and that the Troika programme has formally ended, although we know the Troika mindset is still ruling the roost in our government buildings and the Department of Finance. The media and the government are keen to spin the recovery, but we must ask a recovery for whom? There are some like the top bankers who were protected before and during the recession and now can't wait to return to the old days of bonuses and reckless behaviour. There are politicians who don't know what austerity actually means, but will surely be the first to benefit from a recovery. There's a recovery for the landlords of Dublin, where rents have shot up again in the last year. The question is, is there a recovery for the over 100,000 families who are struggling with their mortgages? Our next crisis is dealing with the mortgage crisis and the credit bubble and the people in negative equity. Is there a recovery, we ask, for the homeless of the recession, the number sleeping rough increased last year. Is there a recovery for our rural communities blighted by emigration? We're at a point where our recession has hopefully ended and we must rebuild. And now is the time that we have to ask what type of country do we want to live in? Do we want another period of austerity for the lower and middle income families while the wealthy remain untouchable? Do we want an economy where workers are pitted against each other for low paid jobs for the foreseeable future? Do we want an economy built on bubbles and where, the banks, where when the banks fail, the people have to foot the bill? We still have a government of austerity, not because of where we are, because it's what they are. We did point out another way in our pre -sub, uh, budget submissions, and I, I won't go through these in detail, but we, our government last year, for example, needed to make a 3.1 billion adjustment. We achieved a similar result by asking parliamentary questions, by getting the figures from the Department of Finance, which had a lesser impact on ordinary families. We had more stimulus, and we even didn't include our wealth tax, because the Department of Finance, in all our budgetary proposals, the one thing they will refuse to cost is a wealth tax. So any time we've included that in any other pre-budget submission, they've rubbished it, saying your figures don't add up because you can't put a real figure on a wealth tax. So even by not including that wealth tax figure, we could still make the deficit up and compare like with like with the government's policies. But we did include a wealth tax and we said any money that would come from that would be put into job creation and bringing up our balance of the Youth Guarantee Fund from Europe. We wanted to reduce the tax burden on ordinary families uh, and save money for, for, for general uh, families, etc. But our government are making good use of the crisis. They're driving away our brightest and best and those who would be most vocal in opposition. The community and voluntary sector is being dismantled and we see a convergence of power to the centre. Local democracy is being diminished and the budgetary and decision-making power is being drawn towards the local authorities and from there back to Dublin. Control of our leader funding, for example, is being taken from local communities and being put into the hands of unelected bureaucrats whose priorities will be di dictated by central government as opposed to the bottom-up approach which is supposed to happen. Local government structures are being reformed but they're not being enhanced, they're not really being given any extra powers. We're seeing through all of this uh, a dilution of human rights, of workers' rights, of social rights and of cultural rights. 
So what does the future hold for us? We're seeing the European and local elections coming up. We feel that we need to increase our mandate, obviously, and we're hoping to do that. One of our EU um, candidates in my area, in the north and northwest, where we have four sitting MEPs, is, is telling us that of all of the four MEPs we've had to date, not one of them ever took a vote against the austerity politics in Europe. Even though 40% of the people in the population in our area voted against all of the treaties. So there isn't, we need to increase the mandate so we get voices in Europe that are going to oppose the austerity politics that is going on. We're increasing our membership and we're also improving our geographic spread because as I said, we aren't as strong on the ground in the south of Ireland and that is, is, is rapidly increasing. And in government in the north, we're also fighting the Tory cuts that are being imposed from Westminster. What, what we're also doing on the ground is that we're very much engaged in outreach with the trade unions. We have the Labour Party in government at the moment with the Conservative Party. Uh, now, the Labour Party would be traditionally very aligned with the trade unions and we're trying to work very much on that relationship because it isn't healthy because the Labour Party and government have just bought into all of the austerity politics and rolled over and had their bellies tickled. So we're working very hard to outreach with the trade unions, with the non-governmental organisations, the community and voluntary sector, rural communities, newly qualified professionals and small and indig indigenous businesses as well as our traditional support base because we feel unless we engage with those groups, we're not really going to make any change at home. If we don't make change at home, we can't be of much support in the rest of the world. We're also building solidarity with comrades on an international level, which is why occasions like this are very important. But we also held a very important uh, occasion in Dublin recently where we invited top trade unionists from the States who are very vocal and can speak out and could say things maybe that we can't even say to our own local trade unions in Ireland. And it was a very, very useful uh, thing for us to do. In 1913, we had a very uh, pivotal moment in Ireland where the workers of Dublin were locked out of the factories by the, by the big barons of industry. And that was celebrated this year. And we've used that centenary celebration of the 1913 lockout to highlight the plight of workers today because there are very many similarities. 1916 is obviously going to be the centenary of our revolution as well. And we, we're working towards making people, reminding the people that we're still fighting the battle that the Irish public, publicans have been fighting since then uh, as well. So I think it's very important that we build locally, but we also build allegiances uh, internationally as well, and that's why we are here. And I think we are seeing certainly on the ground a resurgence and, and, and a movement forward. Uh, we're out of the Troika, as I said, technically, but the politics is, is, is ongoing. But I think uh, initially there was the rabbits in the headline, headlights scenario that Irish people were just totally shocked and dumbfounded by what was happening to them. And they, they were very compliant, they didn't react. We had a number of big marches initially, but then everything seemed to die down. I see that resurging again. We've seen a number of strikes threatened recently and we're hoping that that will rebuild. And I think in the words of the great songwriter who passed away recently, Pete Seeger, I think we will overcome, but we'll overcome together. So, Gurumil Magi, your father.